My name is Timothy Alberino, and this is part eight in a series of lectures based on the content of my book, Birthright, available now in paperback and Kindle on Amazon.com. If you're listening to this lecture on my podcast, you can also watch it on YouTube by visiting my channel. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find it in podcast format by searching The Alberino Analysis on your preferred podcast platform. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Yes, I'm back on Twitter. And most importantly, sign up for my mailing list on timothyalberino.com. In the last episode, we discussed the motivations that led to the fall of the Watchers. Namely, they envied the sons of Adam and lusted after their daughters. These forbidden desires would ultimately culminate in the most devastating catastrophe ever to befall mankind, the Great Flood. But before we get to the Flood, we need to examine the events that precipitated it. It is important to note that the general narrative of the Genesis 6 affair, the descent of the gods, their procreation of hybrid offspring with the daughters of men, and the sudden obliteration of their world in a ruinous cataclysm can be detected in the written records and oral traditions of every primary culture on earth. The ancients referred to the time before the flood, when the gods dwelt among men as the golden age. Countless hours could be devoted to cataloging the parallels in the pre-flood legends of Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greco-Roman, Mesoamerican, Andean, Polynesian, and Asian peoples, among many others. One of the principal commonalities of Golden Age lore is the positive light in which it is cast. The memory of the old world was enshrined in the minds of the ancients as a utopian paradise in which mankind greatly benefited from intercourse with the gods. There is, however, one glaring exception to the rule, the Hebrew account. The ancient Hebrew conceptualization of the Golden Age could not have been more antithetical to that of its contemporaries. In the Hebrew mind, the old world was a dreadful dystopia marked by extreme violence, unbridled depravity, and open defiance against the ordinances of God. The beings who descended from heaven wrought chaos and corruption on earth, provoking the judgment of the great flood. As aforementioned, while the advent of the Golden Age is undoubtedly a major component of ancient Hebrew cosmology, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, has little to say about it because the story was thoroughly chronicled in the Book of Enoch, from which the following details are derived. In the days of Jared, the son of Mahalalel and the father of Enoch, a company of 200 watchers defected from the kingdom of heaven and journeyed to the earth, intent on procuring wives for themselves from the daughters of men. The watchers arrived on the summit of Mount Hermon, the highest peak on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea, straddling the border between Syria and Lebanon. We should resist the temptation to imagine these angelic beings descending from heaven with feathery wings flapping in the wind. As previously noted, except in the context of prophetic iconography, angels are never depicted with wings in the biblical narrative. We do, however, sometimes find them navigating the skies in advanced aerospace vehicles, what Iron Age observers called chariots of fire, or the chariots of God. The biblical writers had to rely on familiar references when attempting to describe visions of extraterrestrial technology. Chariots were the most sophisticated vehicles of conveyance known to them, and as such, provided the most conceivable correlation. Men of that age could not even conceptualize horseless chariots, 
let alone air and spacecraft, and would have had great difficulty describing the mechanisms that powered them. It is also illogical to assume that the elder race, apparently capable of incredible technological feats, would be utilizing horses and chariots for conveyance, a form of transportation that even man abandoned long ago in favor of more efficient means. We may therefore conclude that the Watchers arrived to the summit of Hermon at the helm of advanced aerospace vehicles, which we would today describe as UFOs, and that they likely did so by traversing a wormhole, or stargate, in the sci-fi vernacular. The means by which the Watchers arrived may be debated, but what they did next is abundantly clear. After binding themselves by an oath of mutual imprecations, knowing full well that what they were about to do amounted to sedition, the Watchers descended into the plains of Lebanon and chose among the inhabitants therein the women they desired to wed. Whether they seduced these women or took them by force is unclear. However, because the wives of the Watchers are ultimately implicated in their husband's transgression and judged accordingly, we may infer that they were willing partners. Some researchers speculate that the Watchers were reptilian in appearance. This is almost certainly not true. As sons of God, they bore the semblance of strikingly handsome young men, much like the angels who supped with Lot before Sodom's destruction. This would explain the seeming eagerness of the women to wed the Watchers. It is hard to imagine a beautiful woman falling head over heels for a reptilian freak. It is interesting that the Watchers saw fit to wed these women rather than simply fornicate with them. This procedure reveals that they were after more than sex. Apparently, they intended to procreate families within the covenant of marriage, almost as if they were hoping that the interspecies union might eventually be approved, or at the very least tolerated, by God. Moreover, it appears that marriage to the daughters of men was part of a mutually beneficial transaction. Enoch tells us that the Watchers revealed to men the secrets they were striving to learn. These secrets were related to what today we call science and technology. The bargain was simple. In exchange for their daughter's hands in marriage, the Watchers would teach the sons of Adam, or more precisely, the sons of Cain, the scientific and technological knowledge that they were already striving to learn. The Watchers knew that a hostile takeover of planet Earth would result in swift retribution from the kingdom of heaven, the armies of which defend man's dominion from extraterrestrial assailants. So they devised a plan that would give them legal cover. If the sons of men the lawful regents of the earth, were willing partners in the scheme that they might avoid confrontation with the armies of the kingdom. By willfully giving their daughter's hands in marriage, which was probably done with all the ceremonial formality one might expect for such a momentous occasion, the sons of Adam were authorizing the Watchers to freely operate in their realm. They may even have thought that they were getting the better part of the deal, but they could not have hoped to outsmart these ancient and esteemed members of the elder race. It would soon become clear that, like the fabled Mephistopheles, the Watchers had beguiled mankind into a Faustian bargain. The conjugal union of the elder race and the human race resulted in something extraordinary to say the least. After the Watchers copulated with their brides, the women conceived and gave birth to giants. There is much debate concerning how these women were able to carry to term and deliver gigantic babies, 
a feat which would have surely proven fatal for both mother and child. According to some traditions, the women's wombs were indeed split open by the massive fetuses. But this scenario is not necessary to make sense of the phenomenon. Just like human babies born today with the genetic disorder of gigantism, the size and weight of the hybrid babies may have been typical at birth. But as the infants progressed through childhood, they experienced accelerated growth, resulting in exceedingly large adults. However, in stark contrast to the genetic disorder of gigantism, which weakens the heart and causes a cascade of debilitating conditions, the giant sons of the Watchers were superhumanly enhanced with the DNA of the elder race. It must have been truly terrifying for those who watched in wonder as the children of the gods grew to colossal size and began to consume all the acquisitions of the land. Enoch records that men were forced to feed the giants, and when they could no longer satisfy their enormous appetites, the giants began to feed on men. This may have been the origin of human sacrifice. The Watchers, who were no doubt venerated as living deities, likely demanded a quota of human flesh to be offered up to their semi-divine sons in an act of reverent devotion. Later, post-Diluvian cultures would remember the sanguinary appetite of the gods and reenact this practice in their temples and sacred places. Even feeding their screaming children into the gaping mouths of smoldering idols to be consumed alive in the flames. Unlike the familiar portrayals in Disney cartoons, the giant sons of the Watchers were not stupid brutes. Endowed with the genetic trademarks of their fathers, they would have been truly remarkable beings, both in their physical prowess and their intellectual capacity. It would not have been difficult for them to seize the thrones of every human ruler and build their own kingdoms on earth, which is precisely what I propose that they did. Recall that the Watchers had three objectives in mind. They wanted to marry the daughters of men so that they might procreate their own offspring and through their hybrid progeny, rule the earth by proxy. In other words, the Watchers effectively usurped the terrestrial dominion of mankind through the agency of their hybrid sons who were human enough to claim the birthright of Adam. It was an ingenious plan, and it worked for a while, until men began to petition heaven for redress of the Watcher's crimes. In the next episode, we will further examine the empire of the gods in the Golden Age and the cataclysmic event that brought it to utter ruin. I have much more to say in my book about the topics discussed in this lecture, so if you wish to delve deeper into the details of the Enochian tale, then pick up a copy of Birthright, The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth.